Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our first in our series of briefings today to preview the upcoming Demo-2 mission of the SpaceX Crew Dragon to the International Space Station, the first Crew Dragon flight to launch with humans on board. We're now less than a month away from launch on May 27th and we are kicking off our briefings today with a great lineup to set the stage for the mission. Joining us remotely from across the country, we have NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, Commercial Crew Program Manager Kathy Leaders, International Space Station Program Manager Kirk Shireman, and SpaceX President and Chief Operating Officer Gwen Shotwell. We're going to kick things off by letting them each make opening remarks, uh, but for the members of the media who are joining us by phone, if you have a question, please go ahead and press star one at this time so that we can take down your name. And if you need to withdraw your question at some point, you can always press star two. And for those following at home, we'd love to have you ask some questions as well. You can send them in on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Now we'll start with those opening remarks, beginning with Administrator Bridenstine. Well, hey, it's uh, thank you, Brandy, for opening this up. And of course, it's great to be with everybody on this uh, really exciting day. Uh, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, we announced that we have a new human landing system that's going to take us all the way to the moon. And of course, uh, uh, in, in the midst of more development than we've ever had before in NASA's history, uh, we are going to launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. Um, we're going to do it um, here in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm going to tell you that this is a high priority mission for the United States of America. Um, we as a nation have not had our own access to the International Space Station for nine years. At the same time, we've had American astronauts on the International Space Station for 20 years in a row. And they've been doing this absolutely um, stunning, these stunning experiments and discoveries and advancing the human condition um, from the microgravity of space. Um, and these are capabilities that we, we cannot replicate here on Earth, uh, but they have been tremendously valuable to all of humanity now for, for 20 years as we've had this space station crewed. We need to make sure that we keep it crewed, and not just crewed, but we need to make sure that it has its maximum complement of crew so that we can get the highest return on investment from this $100 billion investment provided by the American taxpayer. And that's what commercial crew is all about. This is a new generation, a new era in human spaceflight. And, and when I say it's new, what I mean is NASA has long um, had this idea that we need to purchase, own, and operate hardware to get to space. And in the past, that has been true. Uh, but now in this new era, NASA, especially in low Earth orbit, NASA has an ability to be a customer, one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit. But we also want to have numerous providers that are competing against each other on cost and innovation. And that's really what we are entering into with this new era of human spaceflight. And of course, uh, SpaceX has been an amazing partner of NASA now for many years, um, including resupply of the International Space Station, soon uh, with providing crew, NASA astronauts, to the International Space Station. Um, and as we announced yesterday with the human landing system, um, we're very hopeful that, that SpaceX will be taking our astronauts all the way to the moon in the not too distant future. So this is a very exciting time. The International Space Station is a critical capability for the United States of America. Having access to it is also critical, and we are moving forward very rapidly with this program um, that is so important uh, to our nation and, in fact, to the entire world. So with that, Kathy, I will, um, I'll give it to you to say a few remarks there from Cape Canaveral. I should say the Kennedy Space Center. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Hey, I can't tell you how an exciting day this is for us, too. Um, Gwen and I have been waiting for this for a while, and uh, I can't think of a better person to be sharing this phone call with right now. Um, but I want to make it clear that this is one of many exciting and hard days that we have in front of us. And Gwen's team and my team are diligently working on getting the vehicles ready, making sure that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed in our analysis, test data, assessments, going through all our reviews, and making sure that we are ready for this important mission to safely fly Bob and Doug up to the International Space Station, serve as a lifeboat, and return them to their families. 
This is a humbling job. I think we're up to it. And I look forward to showing you our progress. Uh, Kirk? To be here today, as we sit here and speak um, today, orbiting over our head is the International Space Station with three humans on board. Um, it's the largest vehicle that's ever orbited the Earth. And uh, this year, we're celebrating 20 years of continuous human presence on board the International Space Station. Uh, our crews have conducted over 4,000 different investigations uh, together with partners in 108 different countries around the globe, truly an international endeavor. But today here we're to talk about the mission, the SpaceX mission, the Demo-2 mission, which is propelling the ISS to our future and uh, really looking forward to that. Today, as Jim mentioned, uh, commercialization is a big uh, effort on board uh, the International Space Station. We're working with uh, commercial partners developing facilities, um, testing modules, testing. Uh, today, we already transport cargo commercially. And very soon, of course, we're looking forward to transporting our crews commercially. This really is the next major step uh, in commercializing low Earth orbit. And, and having a really vital low Earth orbit economy in which NASA is one of many customers. So we're looking forward to that. Um, this launch will allow researchers around the globe to work with astronauts under this, on board the space station to undertake many different, different scientific investigations. Um, today, the SpaceX crew uh, with Chris Casty already on board the International Space Station will be doing experiments on uh, physiology, cardiovascular experiments, physical life science, physical and life sciences, um, testing out life support systems for our future explorations, and uh, together with uh, testing out habitation uh, experiments for our future human space exploration. A little over a week ago, we had our stage operational readiness review for the HTV, the JAXA cargo uh, vehicle. That vehicle will launch from Tanigashima Space Center in southern Japan on May 20th and will arrive at the International Space Station on the 25th of May, just a few days before uh, uh, SpaceX Demo-2 will launch. Just yesterday, we had an all-day meeting uh, doing our stage operational readiness uh, review for the SpaceX Demo-2 launch. And I'm very pleased to announce that we, uh, we passed that review successfully and moving on to our uh, subsequent milestones culminating in a flight readiness review and launch readiness reviews in the very near future. This launch is our next step towards increasing American and really human presence on board the laboratory, the International Space Station. It really is, it really is critical. Um, we're very much in, interested in significantly increasing the amount of crew time and the amount of throughput that we can do, this valuable research that we can do on board the International Space Station, things that we can't be done anywhere else, certainly on the planet. Um, uh, so we look forward to having this flight and then repeatable, uh, very sus repeatable, sustainable low Earth orbit uh, commercial crew transportation flights that allow us to, to test uh, durations of flight of varying durations. So historically, we've had six-month durations uh, here over the last few years. And uh, when, earlier in the shuttle program, we had two- or three-month uh, durations and even two-week durations. But uh, there's lots of other durations we need to explore to understand how the human body adapts to, uh, to zero G. So we're looking forward to uh, exploring those many different types of durations as we go forward. We, had, we can accomplish all this with Launch America on commercial vehicles and shape the future of space exploration and space economy on the International Space Station, the, words, the world's platform for global exploration, global partnership. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Gwen Shotwell, president of SpaceX. And uh, over <coughs> to you, Gwen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank NASA um, we've worked closely with NASA since 2006, and all that work is culminating uh, to this historic event that we have upcoming here in just a few weeks. Um, my heart is sitting right here, and I think it's going to stay there uh, until we get Bob and Doug safely back from the International Space Station. But between now and then, there's still work to do. Um, I've got thousands of SpaceX employees who are focused on this mission. I think we have pounded 
the issues associated with Falcon and Dragon more than any other mission we've had uh, in, our, in our history leading to here. Uh, we have been to the International Space Station 21 times. Uh, we, we hope that that experience ensures, helps us to ensure that uh, this next flight to the International Space Station is uh, even more spectacular uh, and productive. Um, as I mentioned, there is still work to do. Uh, we have uh, a few weeks ahead of us. There's some uh, technical items to close. Uh, in fact, uh, a little bit later today should be our final parachute test, 27th parachute test of this new Mark III design. We're looking forward to finishing that test uh, and getting that item closed out. Um, we spent years working on this vehicle. Uh, Kathy and I have been working together for a decade and a half, and uh, I want to reiterate, uh, it, I couldn't be working with someone better uh, on this historic uh, upcoming, this mission. Um, I wanted to show uh, a video of one of the critical tests that we accomplished uh, just a few months ago in January. It was called the uh, in-flight abort test. This was a, a very large-scale system test to demonstrate uh, the launch escape system, which is one of the primary differences between this Dragon and the Cargo Dragon that we've taken many times to the International Space Station. So the video is rolling. Hope you enjoy it. It was quite a day. So in addition to working closely with Kathy's team on the technical issues and the, the technical work to get done on Dragon and Falcon, we've, we've also spent years working with the crew office and getting to know Bob and Doug. And I think that was a critical element of our view on the, uh, the important nature of this mission is I wanted to make sure everyone at SpaceX understood and knew Bob and Doug as astronauts, as test pilots, badass but dads and husbands. Uh, I wanted to bring some humanity to this uh, very deeply technical effort as well. And uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to fly them here in a few weeks. So demo two is, uh, as I mentioned, just a few weeks away. We are also working on the next vehicle to go to the International Space Station, and that will be the Crew-1 uh, mission. Um, I've got uh, just a couple of photos of uh, the crew training uh, in the Crew-1 Dragon, as well as the Crew-1 Dragon there in the final integration area. Uh, we should be shipping that vehicle in the next few months. Uh, and prepping for the first operational mission. Just bringing it back, Demo-2 is a test mission. Uh, I am not going to say that we haven't spent more on this particular test mission than any other test mission we've flown at SpaceX, uh, but this is a test mission. Uh, we're doing this to uh, ring out uh, the systems, to demonstrate the systems uh, during ascent on orbit at station and during descent with actual crew. Very exciting, very exciting time. So I finished my remarks, Jim. I I think it's time to get back to you. Absolutely, Brandy, I'll, uh, I'll kick it back to you. Yes, we will be taking questions now um, from reporters on the phone and via the Ask NASA hashtag on social media. Again, if you are on the phone, please use star one to let us know you have a question. Um, We're going to start with Eric Berger. And Eric, if you can please indicate who your question is for. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, Gwen, you mentioned your relationship with NASA. Can you talk a little bit about you know how working with NASA has transformed SpaceX? Um, you started with cargo, obviously, and that allowed you to grow into the Falcon 9, and now you're doing crew, and things are looking interesting for the moon, too. Uh, and maybe, Kathy, could you talk about how working with SpaceX has benefited NASA? It certainly seems like this relationship is, is leading to a much more commercial future for the space agency. Thank you. Yeah, so the relationship with NASA has been extraordinary. Um, we started uh, with the COTS program in 2006, uh, and then, of course, the whole proposal and negotiation left effort up, uh, up to then. Um, I think NASA, well, NASA has been an extraordinary customer, an extraordinary partner, um, a mentor for us, um, and, and hopefully, uh, NASA has enjoyed the relationship as much as we have. Uh, we've learned from them. We've obviously uh, su uh, been pleased by their financial support, their technical support, wisdom and knowledge, um, and helping us get to this day. I, I know we were founded, we were founded in 2002 to fly people uh, to low Earth orbit, uh, the moon and Mars, um, and uh, NASA has certainly made that possible. I think the uh, the thing that's been um, most rewarding for for me working over the last um, now, like Wynn said, almost 13 years with SpaceX, is honestly seeing how our NASA teams have learned and how the SpaceX teams have learned and how we together have become stronger as engineering. Uh, technical support for this nation, really, for this nation in the aerospace area, um, and expanding knowledge on, on both fronts for us to provide solutions to future aerospace challenges that are out there. Um, the best way to learn technically is to have a healthy tension and dynamic and, and um, be able to have to defend technical positions, and um, SpaceX makes us defend technical positions as we make SpaceX defend technical positions. And what that does is creates a body of work that I think we as an agency have really um, been able to build, and I can tell you are building on our future program. So I think this has been a great relationship for the both of us over the last 13 years. All right, thank you. We are going to go next to Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Uh, do we have Marsha online? Okay, let's try Dave Mosher with Business Insider. I think in 2002 that SpaceX would one day be working with NASA to resurrect crewed spaceflight in America. I guess let's walk us through how far you think the company has come in that time. Is it possible so for somebody to repeat the, the question? I could the, barely hear it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Please go ahead, Dave. All right, thank you. Uh, this question is for Gwen. I, I just want to one. I just want to ask you: uh, Did you ever think in 2002 that SpaceX would one day be working with NASA to resurrect uh, crewed spaceflight in America? And if you could just give us a sense of how far you personally think the, the company has come since that time. Well, uh, I certainly thought we would work with NASA. Uh, I was hired in 2002, uh, actually, as the chief salesperson, <laughs> so I certainly hoped that we would work with NASA. Uh, I knew when I, when I joined the team that NASA wanted to uh, build a space transportation system that was reliable enough and low cost enough for people to be able to go to other planets. That sounded very kind of outer worldly to me at that time in 2002, um, but I certainly understood that if we were to achieve that, we would certainly do that hand in hand with NASA. So I've seen this company grow from roughly 10 employees to um, th the thousands that we have now. Um, we've grown up 
uh, it was a little wild west early on, um, but can candidly, I think that um, those beginnings and those roots are critically important to our success even today when we're talking about flying people uh, and flying other precious cargo as well. You have to learn those hard lessons, and uh, I think sometimes the aerospace industry uh, shies away from failure in the development phase. Um, it, it looks bad politically, it's tough, and, and the media certainly makes a lot out of, uh, of failures, but candidly, that's the best way to, uh, to learn, is to push your systems to their limit, uh, which includes your people systems and your processes, uh, and learn where you're weak uh, and make things better. Thank you, Gwen. Let's try Marsha Dunn from the Associated Press again. Yes, can you hear me now? We can. Oh, wonderful, yes. Um, Ms. Shotwell, I have a question for you. Uh, flying astronauts is going to be taking SpaceX to a whole new level, and you sort of alluded this with your heart in your throat, but how much pressure are you feeling uh, having uh, astronauts' lives at stake as you get ready to launch? And what are you telling your team? How are you um, reinforcing the message for the need for safety at all costs? Thank you. So, so I, I can't, to be honest, I can't tell you how I'm going to feel um, until that day. Uh, I'm nervous now, not because I'm on camera, but because I'm about ready to fly Bob and Doug. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I will be nervous until, I'll, there'll be a little sense of relief when they're in orbit. How's that? I'll feel a little relief when they're in orbit. I'll feel more relief when they get to station. And then obviously I will start sleeping again when, they, uh, when they're back safely uh, on the planet planet Earth. Um, as far as my team goes, uh, they don't need to be reminded uh, about the criticality of the work that every person uh, is doing for this mission. Uh, the technicians know. In fact, I've got a suggestion box, an anonymous suggestion box, and as we came closer to this mission a year or a year and a half ago, my suggestion box was full of great ideas to make sure we were all cognizant of, uh, of uh, the mission that we were undertaking. We have work orders, that's basically how we build these, these vehicles and test these vehicles, electronic work orders, and a bunch of the techs wanted to make sure that we had pictures of Bob and Doug uh, on the work orders. Um, and there were lots of suggestions like that. So uh, I don't think I need to remind my employees how important this is. Uh, they remind themselves and, uh, and they are helpful in reminding me. All right, thank you. Our next question will be from Michael Sheets with CNBC. My question is uh, for Jim, as well as a lot of the NASA folks that have seen this uh, program built out over the last decade or so. In terms of how much it's cost to get here today versus compared to a traditional, like, single source method of approaching contracting. Does NASA view this in hindsight as an ultimate cost benefit uh, for the for the agency? And can you give me an example of a way or two in which maybe SpaceX now is helping NASA to uh, achieve and, and save taxpayers dollars? Somebody's going to have to repeat the question because I, I can only catch a few words there. Michael, could you repeat that? Sure. Just just a restate uh, simply I'm curious to know looking at the scope of the commercial crew program in terms of NASA being NASA being a partner rather than the sole source contractor uh, for this this mission um, what ways does NASA see this as a cost beneficial arrangement for the agency and maybe some examples of the way SpaceX now is helping the agency save money as well as especially just taxpayer dollars so how can this help us save money now and how can it help us in the future? Uh, well, the, I mean, the idea is uh, in, in, the, in the short term, uh, I think the, uh, the commercial resupply missions, of course, have demonstrated cost savings. Uh, commercial crew um, is going to demonstrate cost savings if you compare it to the space shuttle. Um, it also, of course, it increases safety. We just watched this amazing, amazing video of, of a launch abort um, that was spectacular to watch and even better um, in its level of success. Um, and so when we look at these kind of things, um, uh, 
we're we're very pleased with with the um, level of investment that we've made, what we're getting for that investment. Um, but we're also very hopeful for the future as well. Uh, again, the goal is for NASA to be a customer, um, and we want a very robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit where um, private industry is going to space to do activities like manufacturing or maybe uh, ad, you know advancing materials in ways that cannot be done here on Earth. Um, maybe it's pharmaceuticals. You know the the experiments that we're doing on the International Space Station um, are experiments that are designed to be uh, commercially viable in the future. Not in every circumstance, but more and more, that's the direction we're going. Um, and when we think about, you know, the ability to print human organs in 3D or the ability to um, create artificial retinas using advanced materials, these are things that are being transformational for humanity and, and really enable a commercial marketplace to form in space. And in order for that to be successful, we need to have uh, the capability of accessing space, not just for NASA, but for all of humanity. Um, and I would also say, just from a financial perspective, um, because of the investments NASA has made into SpaceX, um, we now have about, I say we, the United States of America now has about 70% of the commercial launch market. That is, um, that is a big change from 2012, when we had exactly 0%, not, not, not the human launch market, say the commercial launch market. Uh, 2012, we had 0%. Today, we've got 70%. Of course, Gwen can tell me if that's if my numbers are a little off here. Um, but the investment that we have made into SpaceX and the investment SpaceX has made into itself um, have really resulted in, I think, something that is going to be um, very beneficial, not just for human space exploration, but beneficial for the economy, beneficial from an export perspective. You know, my, my boss, the president of the United States, likes to talk a lot about the trade deficit and the balance of payments. Well, when it comes to commercial launch now, uh, the United States of America um, is in the lead. Um, and it's because of investments made by NASA. Um, and we're very proud of that. So I think the long-term implications are going to be uh, very positive uh, from, this, from this effort. OK. And a reminder that we are taking and questions on, uh, space, on on social media as well. You can use the hashtag AskNASA for that. Um, and we'll go to a few now, starting with um, Timothy from Twitter asking how American human spaceflight will be similar to and different from the space shuttle era. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Bridenstine could start us off on that, and we'll see if anybody else wants to jump in as well. Um, yeah, so uh, you know the future of human spaceflight is going to be very different than it is today. We think about what we're doing on the International Space Station to commercialize low Earth orbit. Um, we envision a day in the future where we have a dozen space stations in low Earth orbit, all operated by commercial industry for their own purposes, and that NASA could be a customer of those of those space stations. And of course, um, we envision a day when we're going to the moon, and we're not just going with government-owned systems, but we're going as a customer. Um, and, and of course, yesterday we announced, announced the human landing system for that eventuality. And of course, we go to the moon for a purpose. We need to learn how to live and work on another world for long periods of time so we can get to Mars. Um, and of course, we, that, that, that mission is very complicated. Uh, Earth and Mars are on the same side of the sun once every 26 months. Um, so the moon is the proving ground for the destination, and of course, the destination is Mars. Um, the future is bright. The NASA budget um, is as strong today as it's ever been in history um, from, from a nominal dollar perspective. Um, and of course, the, the budget request that we just submitted uh, takes NASA from 22 billion up above 25 billion. Um, and of course, a lot of that is focused on, on getting us back to the moon, uh, or I should say forward to the moon, because this time when we go, we're not coming home. We're going to stay. We're going forward to the moon. Um, and SpaceX um, has some really visionary um, capabilities that they're bringing to the table that NASA wants to uh, leverage and, um, and benefit from. So uh, the future of, of space exploration is, is very different than the past. And yet all of us are building on that legacy that is really amazing. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing time to be at the helm of this little agency called NASA. Okay, and we have uh, one um, coming in from Kim on 
Facebook specifically for Kathy. She says that she is a Girl Scout leader in Oklahoma and some of her scouts are watching you right now. Could you please speak about um, how being a Girl Scout helped you prepare to lead a mission to space? Well, I was a Girl Scout a really long time ago. I actually was a Girl Scout in Tokyo, Japan. I had gone to uh, elementary school and middle school, and so it shows how um, we had a local Girl Scout troop at the American school that I went to there. Um, and so what it does tell you, and, and you, you learn about how can you serve, and what we're finding today is moving through and, and getting ready to serve this nation by flying crew. It's another place where um, we're applying the lessons learned that you know you learn through the different organizations that you're part of as you're growing up, but then moving into serving this country. So I really um, appreciated uh, the groundwork that was laid there. And uh, I'm so happy that all the Girl Scouts, I'm hoping more Girl Scouts come out and watch us live as we're gonna be flying our crewed missions to the International Space Station. And hopefully we'll be seeing another Girl Scout fly one day. Absolutely. Going back now to the phone, we'll take a question next from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Thank you. Um, for Gwen, uh, one of the things that have set apart American spaceflight from the very beginning is it's working in the open. Can you confirm that SpaceX will be providing uninterrupted coverage of the um, air to ground, the space to ground conversations from launch through docking? and how you will share um, the activities aboard the spacecraft after launch and while it's in orbit until it reaches the space station? SpaceX has been a very transparent company from the beginning. Um, I'll never forget the first Falcon 1 flight. Uh, we had photos of, uh, of that vehicle lifting off and the back end was, uh, was on fire. Uh, and Elon said, post that photo. Uh, so we, have, uh, we try to be as transparent as we possibly can. There are um, State Department restrictions on the kinds of information that we can uh, broadcast uh, globally. Um, the, as far as the webcast goes, it's a joint webcast between NASA and SpaceX for this particular mission. So uh, there'll be joint decisions on, um, on how that gets executed and the information that gets flowed. Um, I can't imagine a scenario where uh, the public doesn't know what's going on uh, with this particular mission, whether it's in real time or whether it's uh, slightly time delayed or uh, whether the information comes out an hour or so later. Thank you. Next, we'll take a question from Bill Harwood. Bill, can you hear us? I hear you loud and clear. How me? Here you good. Bill Harwood, one. Did you got me? We do. Okay, thanks. For Jim, uh, speaking of the criticality of keeping the space station staffed, can you update us on where NASA stands with buying a seat on the October Soyuz? Is that a done deal yet? And is that the only seat you're planning to buy at this point? Or are you still talking about the uh, the flight next April as well? Thanks. So I know our teams have been negotiating on the next Soyuz launch, which would be in October, um, and we're getting very close to finalizing that that deal. Um, and I think it's um, it's it's uh, within days of being signed. Uh, and and of course that's uh, that's a positive thing. We we want the relationship um, in space exploration to remain strong. Uh, we see a day when. Um, Russian cosmonauts can launch on American rockets and American astronauts can launch on Russian rockets. Remember, um, half of the International Space Station is Russian. And if we're going to make sure that we have continual access to it and that they have continual access to it, um, then we're going to need to be willing to launch on each other's vehicles. Um, so we are negotiating right now for uh, a launch in October. We're very, very close. I think it's going to be finalized in a, in a matter of days. As far as how we continue the relationship after that, I think it's going to be more of a, a, a non-exchange of funds kind of relationship where, where we trade. Uh, and I think that's, um, that's the kind of partnership that we um, would, would very much value. Um, I think as far as 
a second Soyuz seat, um, we we want to see kind of um, the level of risk that that we need to accept. Um, you know, Demo Two uh, is is going to be successful, um, and then when that when Demo Two comes home and we evaluate how it di how it did, um, and we're looking at Crew One, um, we're going to be able to to look at um, at, at where we are and then make a determination if we might need a, a second Soyuz and, and been, uh, you know, begin negotiations at that point. So, um, Kirk, Kirk, I know you've been working on this. Do you have anything to add? No, sir, I think that's great. The, the key here is, uh, I'm with you, Demo 2 is going to be successful. What we need to be is repeatable. So it's not only looking at, at uh, Crew 1, but it's also Crew 2. So we're watching all those vehicles, how are they progressing, and whether or not we need to go uh, enter in discussions for a future Soyuz seat to make sure that we maintain human presence, uh, U.S. presence on the International Space Station. So uh, no, no, no significant discussions at this point in time. Um, on, six, on 64S, the spring of, of, uh, of 2021's uh, uh, launch, but uh, we'll watch how things progress and, and then we'll uh, decide at that time. Thank you. Next, we'll take a question from Stephen Clark. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I have a question for Gwen. The development of the Crew Dragon started as a public private partnership with cost sharing between. NASA and SpaceX. So I'm interested in if you can tell us how much SpaceX has invested from its own internal funding toward the development of the Crew Dragon spacecraft. I'm just trying to get a handle on how much or what percentage of the total cost uh, came from SpaceX. Thank you. SpaceX invests heavily uh, in our products, but candidly, I can't tell you what, uh, uh, what the investment has been in, uh, in Dragon 2. Um, not because I don't want to. I, I, I don't know what the number is. Okay, how about next we take a question from Gita Sinceri with ABC. Yes, this is for Kirk Sharman. Uh, the hashtag for this is Launch America. How, it's been nine long years since we've been able to do this. What does this mean to you, Kirk? Well, first of all, to me personally as an American, I'm very, very proud. You know, it's, it's been July 8, 2011 was the last time uh, Americans left U.S. soil and went to space. And so it's been a long time. I'm very much looking forward to this. If you really look back in the ISS program, uh, it was February 2, 2003 when the Columbia accident occurred. Since that time, most of our U.S. long-duration astronauts have actually flown up on Russian vehicles. So this really is, it's, it's even bigger than, uh, than uh, July 8, 2011. It's been a long time since all of our crews flew up on, on U.S. rockets on U from U.S. soil. So a, so a huge deal to us. I believe it's a huge deal to our international partners. Um, today, our, our Canadian astronauts, our European astronauts, our Japanese astronauts are very much looking forward to flying up on our, on our vehicles. And, and as Jim was discussing, we hope very soon our Russian cosmonauts will fly up on our vehicles uh, as well. So really, I'm personally very, very excited. It's a huge thing for the International Space Station program and for our international partners. And uh, we're, we're all just very excited. Okay, we're going to go back to uh, some Ask NASA questions from social media. This one's coming from Peter on Twitter, and I think might go to Gwen. Uh, as Crew Dragon serves more missions and SpaceX and NASA acquire more data, are there any plans to make modifications or improvements to the Crew Dragon in the future? Any changes to uh, the Dragon vehicle will be a, a joint uh, discussion between SpaceX and NASA. Um, we've taken a long time to get to where we are. Uh, on the other hand, we are an organization that learns and learns rapidly. So it would not surprise me if there were some things that we wanted to change. Um, I don't believe, although knock on wood, I don't believe there'll be uh, gigantic changes where we're going to have to uh, uh, make major changes to this vehicle. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if we had a couple things that we wanted to go back and work, but uh, we will have to work closely with NASA on that and get, uh, get the changes done uh, and recertified. All right, and another one um, from social media, this one coming from Zach on Twitter. Uh, I think it might be for Jim Bridenstein. He says, Demo 2 is a historic mission for NASA and SpaceX, but COVID-19 me means that it's safer to watch from home. How should the world plan to participate in the mission? 
I think that's a very important question. We are, we are asking people to watch from home. Uh, when we look back to the space shuttle launches, we had hundreds of thousands of people that would descend on the Kennedy Space Center. And of course, Kennedy was always very welcoming, opened the gates, let everybody in. Um, and people watched from the beaches and all the way from Orlando and other places. Um, you know, the, the challenge that we're up against right now is we want to keep everybody safe. That's the number one highest priority of NASA, keeping people safe. Um, and so we're asking people not to travel to the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and I, I will tell you that that makes me sad to even say it. Um, boy, I wish we could make this into something really spectacular. Um, but where we are right now, we need to get commercial crew launched. We need Demo 2 to be successful. Um, and, and the best way we can do that is to do it while keeping everybody safe. And, and having large crowds of, of, of hundreds of thousands of people at the Kennedy Space Center, now, now is not the time for that. Um, it, would be, it would be damaging um, if, we, if we had some, um, some setbacks. We don't want an outbreak. Um, we need a spectacular moment that all of America can see and all of the world can see to inspire not just those of us who've been waiting years for this, but to inspire the generations that are coming. Um, and, and we need to do it in a way that's responsible. So we're asking people not to travel to Kennedy, uh, but to watch online um, or watch on, watch on your television at home. Of course, we'll, we will have it on, on NASA TV, um, but we're asking people not to not to make the trip to Kennedy. Okay, going back to the phone bridge now, we're gonna go to Joey Roulette from Reuters. Hey, thanks. Um, for NASA and SpaceX, has NASA and SpaceX considered extending the in-orbit operational lifetime of Crew Dragon beyond 110 days, uh, depending on how long the DM2 mission will be extended by? Um, and is making such an extension possible? And then for uh, Jim Bridenstine, um, you're in negotiations with Roscosmos. What's on the table for those negotiations? What are you trading or considering trading? Thanks. Uh, so uh, I'll take the second question first, and then I'll turn the, the question over to, to Kirk. Um, so when we're in negotiations with Roscosmos right now, it's really about price. Um, there's, not, there's not much to trade at this point. So, um, you know, for the last... Nine years, we have been purchasing rides on Russian Soyuz rockets, um, and those the, the costs have gone they've gone up significantly. Um, what we're trying to do now is just negotiate on price, um, and then once we have our own launch capability, uh, we can we can negotiate for um, non-exchange of fund kind of uh, capabilities. Uh, Kirk, I'll turn it over to you for the uh, the other question. Yeah. So I think the other question was for someone else, but I, I agree with you on the uh, negotiations with Roscosmos, uh, largely on price, and uh, and uh, and we're looking forward to uh, a time when we don't have to negotiate for price. We actually trade a seat on a U.S. vehicle for a seat on a Russian vehicle. And I'll jump in on the first one. I mean, we do know SpaceX and NASA does know what the life, what what are the components that limit the life on orbit. And um, one of those is a component that's in the solar rays. And so there is a potential, if we needed to, that we could even look at potentially extending the life of that component, depending how the, the hardware worked on orbit. But the plan right now is for us to get to the operational missions as quickly as possible but that data potentially would be there if there was, for some reason, there was an issue and we had to do that. We do understand what the life limiting components are. All right, our next question will be coming from Jeff Faust with Space News. Uh, good morning, it's a question for uh, Kathy. You mentioned you still needed to uh, dot some I's and cross some T's. I wonder if you could talk in a little bit more detail about what's left to uh, do before the launch, in particular the uh, review into the Merlin engine anomaly from the earlier Falcon 9 launch and the uh, Crew Dragon parachute certification. Thanks. So we do, Gwen already talked about one big milestone, which is us doing our final uh, parachute drop test. Um, we do have a, we're finishing up testing on some other launch vehicle components. We have reviewed the uh, anomaly uh, resolution 
of the, the Starlink launch and actually have cleared the engines on our vehicle um, for that failure. So that actually is behind us right now. Um, but like everybody knows, the spacecraft keeps, it's still processing. The launch vehicle is still processing. And, and as you're um, processing vehicles, there are little issues that come up that we have to work through. Along with us, what people don't realize is most of our human certification activities are being completed with this mission. And so the team's going through really about 95% of the human rating certification on this mission. So uh, Kirk talked about one of the big critical reviews that we had yesterday, which was the stage operational readiness review. We have our flight test readiness reviews coming up um, first with uh, SpaceX on Friday and then the NASA reviews on the 11th. And then Kirk also talked about we're getting ready for the agency flight readiness review on the 20th of May. So all these are critical activities that we need to get done right to be able to make sure that we can fly Bob and Doug safely. Next, we'll hear from Jackie Waddles with CNN. Hey, folks. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, so my question is for Gwen. I know everyone's really tired of talking about COVID-19, but I know it's also top of mind for so many people. So, uh, Gwen, I was wondering if you could talk us through SpaceX's response, uh, measures that you guys may have implemented to keep employees safe, and how this mission might look differently on your end on launch day. So actually, I'm going to start out by talking about how we kept Bob and Doug safe, and then I'll move into uh, what we're doing as a company to keep our employees safe. Um, we uh, had Bob and Doug here for training. Uh, in fact, we actually have some Crew One, uh, the Crew One astronauts here for training as well. Um, we are ensuring that the only essential personnel are near them. They're wearing masks and gloves. We're cleaning the training facility twice daily. Uh, I think we're really um, doing a great job to ensure that uh, uh, we are not impacting the safety or, or the health of the astronauts' lives. And we're largely doing the same thing for our employees. We are nothing uh, if our employees uh, uh, aren't in great health uh, and, uh, and able to work with a clear mind uh, and a healthy system. So we're taking temperatures, we're wearing masks in public areas, we are um, social distancing uh, as well. Uh, we've got uh, at least half our engineering staff working from home, actually probably more than that. Uh, and for those, as I mentioned, for those that can't work from home, um, we've got uh, protective gear for them to be able to get their jobs done. Uh, the facility is almost always very clean. Uh, for those of you that have seen it, uh, it's even cleaner uh, these days. And as far as what the day is going to be like, launch day, um, from, a, from a COVID perspective, um, it is a shame, you know, NASA and SpaceX have worked so hard to get to this day um, and the American public has come along uh, this long journey with us. So it is a shame that more people uh, are not going to be able to uh, enjoy it in, in Florida. However, it is the right thing to do. Watch it from home, watch it online, uh, watch, uh, watch it on TV. Um, we'll keep you as up to date as we absolutely possibly can. Uh, and uh, and uh, be there for the ride with us, and we'll just be there. We'll be together in spirit uh, more so than uh, in physical space. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Samantha Masanaga from the LA Times. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, kind of similar to Jackie's. Um, this is for uh, Jim or Kathy. Um, can you talk a little more about some of the precautions against COVID-19 that you? put in place um, for Bob and Doug's uh, NASA-specific training to keep them safe? Yeah, I'll let, Kathy, I'll let you talk to it. You've been working it. Yeah, I, I really appreciate what Gwen was saying. You know, when this was an environment, we, we knew it was going to be tough getting ready for launch. Um, but then in this new environment, we had to take even more precautions. Um, because it's really about not only Bob and Doug's safety, but it's also about the safety of the crew on board the International Space Station. So, but this is honestly a concern even without COVID-19. We, we already have um, health stabilization plans. We have ways to, to make sure that the crews 
um, take it care of and then goes into quarantine um, prior to the missions to make sure that they don't um, infect the International Space Station. So this, so when we understood we were going to be working in this new environment, we and the SpaceX team worked on how we needed to amend how we were working with the different crews to make sure that the they were had all the safety and health precautions needed to make sure that they didn't get sick. And, and that crew honestly also extends past the Bob and Doug, but also critical um, mission support team members, um, NASA team members that need to support these activities, and looking at even how we're able to do our testing and our um, support of the vehicle integration activities. We ha we've had to relook and assess and retool how we do all of that to make sure that we're keeping our teams healthy and safe and that the folks that we need to have healthy to support the mission are ready to go and able to support the mission. We are just about out of time, but we'll take one more question. Uh, let's go to Irene Klotz from Aviation Week. Thanks, Brandy. Uh, good morning. Uh, I have two questions, actually. The first one is for Gwen. Uh, Jim mentioned in his opening remarks your win on the HLS. Congratulations. So I hope this isn't too off topic, but can you tell us how the infusion of $135 million is going to impact the timing and the development of Starship? Yeah, the, the, the work that we'll be doing with NASA uh, during this uh, early phase uh, is not going to impact, uh, at least from a timing perspective, the work that we're doing on Starship. Uh, in fact, we crafted our bid carefully to ensure that uh, we're working closely with NASA to understand what the ultimate requirements are for human spaceflight on a vehicle like Starship. Uh, and then we will work to, uh, to roll those things in uh, as, we, as we move forward with the vehicle. Thanks. And I had a quick question for Kirk. Um, what's the trade-off between bringing Dragon 2 back as early as possible to continue with certification and getting um, and having the crew stay longer to help out aboard the ISS? How are you? What are the trade-offs that you're going to be making for that decision? Thanks. Sure, that's a great, uh, I mean, you hit it. It is a trade-off. So on board the International Space Station, there's a tremendous amount of work. In fact, uh, Chris is an amazing astronaut. Uh, he's working very, very hard, uh, but there's more work than Chris can do. And in fact, in some cases, it has to be multiple people, not just one person. So it's getting and accomplishing the work, the important work that we have to do on board the International Space Station versus bringing that vehicle home so that we can complete the human certification of the, of the SpaceX Dragon uh, vehicle so that we can fly Crew-1. So it's a trade-off of those two things. What we would like to do from a station perspective is keep them on orbit as long as we can until that Crew-1 vehicle is just about ready to go, bring Dragon 2, uh, br bring uh, Demo-2 home, allow that certification work to complete and, and launch Crew-1. So we'll be watching the preparation of Crew-1 vehicle and when we're confident it's just about ready to go, that's when we'll, uh, we'd like to bring home Dragon 2, uh, I'm sorry, Demo 2. That way we can, keep, uh, we can keep the work going on board the International Space Station, basically maximize the utility of the work on our board ISS and maximize the, uh, the uh, or minimize the amount of time that we're uh, in, at a crew of one on board the ISS while still maintaining the focus on this test flight and making sure that we accomplish all the certification requirements that we have. That is going to be all the time that we have for questions today. But before we wrap up, I believe Administrator Bridenstine had some closing remarks for us. Sure. Uh, I'd like to maybe just hit on a, a few things that, that recently came up in, in the questions. Um, NASA has been working with SpaceX uh, on the Starship now for um, a, a good while, ahead of, the, ahead of the contract, as a matter of fact, um, from a technical perspective, but uh, also uh, with, a, with a tipping point contract where um, we invested um, in SpaceX to help them um, figure out how do we do in-space transfers of, of fuel, sp uh, specifically um, you know, liquid oxygen and, and liquid hydrogen and, and other capabilities. So, um, so NASA has been um, investing in the Starship ahead of this. This was for the Irene Klotz question um, about how this changes things. And I think, I think um, 
I think Gwen hit it correctly when she said it really doesn't. We're we're moving forward in the in the same way that we were before, um, and and now there's 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 resources to uh, to maybe even move faster. Um, so there's there's that, and then the other thing I wanted to reiterate was um, that NASA has been very satisfied with the level of safety um, from 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 our perspective, our astronauts, our commercial crew um, folks, um, both civil servants and contractors. Um, and, and they've been working side by side with the SpaceX team and in fact, traveling back and forth. Um, and I know Kathy has been working very diligently on making sure that our people are safe. And she has been very satisfied with the level of safety that, um, that all of our people have had on this program. So, um, so I want to reiterate that. The other thing I think is important is just, um, to understand the the historic nature of this flight. Um, we think about uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and then space shuttle. Um, those are really the you know the four times in history when we have put humans on brand new spacecraft. Um, and now we're doing it for a fifth time. and if and that's just the United States. If you look globally, this will be the ninth time in history um, when we've put humans on a brand new spacecraft. And the last time the United States did it, was on STS-1 when we launched the space shuttle for the first time back in 1981. So it's been a long time since we've put humans on a brand new spacecraft. Um, but that's what this is. And it is truly a test flight, to be very clear. Um, yes, is, they're going to go to the International Space Station, and Bob and Doug are going to do amazing work while there. But this, we should not lose sight of the fact that this is a test flight. Um, we're, we're doing this to learn things. And it's also true that, um, that we're taking it very, very seriously from a safety perspective. Um, so this is, um, this, is, this is a big day for NASA. It's a big day for SpaceX. I like how Gwen said that her heart, her heart is, is up in her neck right now. I think there's a lot of people that feel that way. Uh, but, but, um, but this is an important mission for the United States of America. We need to retain access to the International Space Station. And in fact, it's an important mission for the world. So um, we're very much looking forward to it. And uh, thank you all for attending this conference. Thank you, Administrator Biden Stein and all of our briefers. We appreciate you being here with us today. On that note, we're going to say goodbye for now, but everybody following along can stay tuned. Our next briefing will begin at 1130 Central, 1230 Eastern here on NASA TV. We'll see you then.